Hey, uh, thank you guys so much for being here tonight. And if you're a little bit newer, I just wanted to be the first to say thank you so much for joining us and being a part of this experience. We're so thankful that you joined us. Um, let's give it up for our first-time guests. That's the only appropriate way to welcome family into the house. Truth is, the moment that you step through our doors, we considered you more like family. But hey, we also need to recognize a very special group of people, and that's our online community. Let's give it up for everyone watching online. We love you guys. Thank you. Wherever you're tuning in from, we appreciate you. We believe God's doing amazing things wherever you're at. Hey, we're in a series right now called King of Kings, King of Kings. And uh, last week, Pastor Josh preached. You guys love Pastor Josh's message. It's really good. He did an amazing job kicking off the series. And now I'm going to continue in our series. For those of you who are a little bit newer, maybe you didn't join us last week. Um, we are in a series called King of Kings. And the premise of this series is we are talking about Jesus. We're talking about Jesus. And Jesus, one of the names ascribed to him in scripture is the King of kings. We're going to go to Revelation chapter 1, verses 4 through 6. Here's what it says. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come. And from the seven spirits which are before his throne and from Jesus Christ who is, everybody say is. Everybody say is. is. Now I'll say it with your chest, is. is. I love whenever you say that, people are like, Is. <laughs> Say it with your chest, is, is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. What is this scripture really talking about? Because there's a lot of words, but I want to boil it down to really the core of what this scripture actually means. The author is essentially saying that there are earthly rulers, earthly kings, and earthly authorities, but all of them are actually beneath King Jesus. Our King, Jesus, the King of all kings, the Prince of the rulers of the earth, he has dominion and authority, and his reign supersedes that of the earthly rulers and powers of this world. I'm thankful that we can think of any powerful ruler or authority in this world and Jesus, his authority triumphs over. It supersedes that authority that exists here on the earth. I'm thankful we serve a king above all kings. That's what we're talking about in this series. And tonight, we're gonna talk about one aspect of Jesus and really names given to Jesus. How Jesus is referred to as the lion and the lamb. That's going to be the, the title of tonight's message. So why don't you guys do this? We're going to flip over to John chapter 1, verse 29. Here's what it says. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Revelation 5.5 5 says, But one of the 24 elders said to me, Stop weeping. Look, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the heir to David's throne, has one the victory. He is worthy to open the scroll and its seven seals. Both of these examples, both of these names, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the lamb of God, this is a reference to Jesus Christ. He is both the lion and the lamb. Can we pray? Heavenly Father, thank you for these moments. God, thank you for every person in this room, everyone watching online. Lord, we're so grateful for your presence. God, we ask that you would change us, rearrange us, help us to see your word in a clear way today. God, we're so thankful that we come with open eyes and ears and open heart to understand what it is that you want to say. God, speak to us. Your servants are listening. And we're so thankful for the Cleveland Browns in Jesus' name. Everybody agree with this head? Amen. Amen. That was a rowdier amen than in the United. This is great. Good start. Hey, have you ever been in a position where you had to pick a side? You ever been in a position like that before? You needed to pick a side. Most of us have probably been in positions like that before. I'm going to play a fun game. We're going to do a little this or that. Is that okay? Now, it only works if you participate. So I'm going to give two options. You don't have to say what you'd prefer, but I'm just going to ask you to lift your hand for whichever one you'd prefer. Whichever one bears witness with your spirit, I want you to lift your hand. So we're going to play a little game, this or that. You ready? Dogs or cats? Dogs? Cats. Okay. We know who we can trust. Chick-fil-A or Canes? 
I know I'm stepping on toes now. Chick-fil-A or Canes? Chick-fil-A? Canes. And now we know who the Jesus followers in the room are. I'm just kidding. All right, let's, let's keep going. I got a couple more. Eggs, scrambled or sunny side up? Scrambled, sunny side up. All right, that was actually pretty balanced. Now, this last one, I promise, will create way more controversy than the others. So I apologize in advance if it creates any division or strife between your neighbor. But I have to ask, pineapple on pizza? Yes or no? Yes? <laughs> no. <laughs> now I really know who I can trust in this room. I don't know if, pi if pineapple belongs on pizza. It's just me. It's just an opinion, okay? Don't get mad at me. Don't turn off your ears just because of my position on pineapple on pizza. Look, the reality is we all find ourselves in positions like this. You know, we, we find ourselves in positions where we feel like we have to choose between one thing or the other. But then I also think we find ourselves in positions where maybe we're asked a question, but two things are placed at odds against one another that shouldn't be placed at odds against one another. I'll give you an example. Gas pedal or brake? Don't answer. <laughs> Oxygen or water? <laughs> the point for these examples is that you literally would not live without both of those working together. When I drive my car, I need both the gas pedal and the brake. When I live and breathe, I need air and I also need water to live. They're both ne they're necessities. They are necessary for life itself. What I'm trying to get us to understand is that I think sometimes we get put in positions where we're putting things at odds against each other that should never be at odds. And I think that is true of grace and truth. I believe that in our world, not just in Christian communities, but in our world, there's a tendency, maybe it's intentional, unintentional, subconsciously or consciously, we've tried to remove grace from truth. Jesus can be grace, but he can't be truth too. Here's the thing. I believe that those two dynamics were never meant to be separated. Jesus is both grace and truth. I'll prove it to you. John 1.17 says, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Grace and truth, not grace or truth, not pick one, but you can't have the other. Jesus came in both grace and truth. And here's the thing, I wanna make sure that I define grace and truth for a moment because this is where we're gonna camp out for a lot of our conversation tonight. Grace and truth, grace by definition is God's unmerited or unearned favor. By definition, and I'm giving you a simple definition, you could honestly preach a 10-week series on truth by itself and grace by itself. But for the purpose of this conversation, I'm gonna try and simplify it. Grace at its core is God's unearned, unmerited favor. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 says that by grace through faith, we can experience salvation. We receive salvation. We come in right standing with God by or according to grace through faith. Not by works, not by our good deeds, not by all the good things we've done, not by avoiding enough bad things or enough mistakes. No, by grace and grace alone and receiving the gift of grace through faith. Grace, the perfect picture you can get is Jesus on the cross. It's Jesus' bloody body on the cross in an empty tomb. It's not just the cross, but it's the tomb. It is Jesus and what he did for you and me. He stepped in your place and mine. He did what we could not do for ourselves. He stepped in our place. He stood in the gap. He created a way for you and I to come back in right relationship with God the Father. That is grace. It's unmerited. It's unearned. You couldn't do anything to earn grace in your life. This is grace and truth. Now, you could go anywhere in the world and find a different definition. The truth is, you don't have to go very far to find a different definition for truth. Turn on social media, turn on your TV, watch the news. You can find a different definition for truth in plenty of places. But here's what we believe. I'm just gonna give you again a very simplified definition of truth. It's the inspired word of God. 
we're just gonna make it really simple. The inspired word of God, John 14, six says, Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the father except through me. Jesus is saying, I am the truth. I'm not one of a million different variations of truth. I'm not one of a few choices. I am the truth. I am the only way, I am the only truth, and I am the only life. In John 1, 1, here's what it says. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. In John 1, 1, that term, the word, it's actually a parallel for Jesus. Jesus and the word are the same. They're one in one. They can't be separated. We can't take Jesus apart from the word of God and the word of God apart from Jesus. They are one in the same. So that would mean that the word of God is the inspired truth. The word of God is the only true north. The word of God is the only truth. The word of God can be the only source that determines which way is straight and which way is backwards, which way is right, which way is left, which way is up and which way is down. It can only be the word of God because the word of God has this. It has withstood the test of time. Many different variations of truth don't last very long, but my God's version of truth, his definition of truth is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. It is the only version of truth that has withstood the test of time and it will withstand the test of time. It's the only truth, but grace and truth, they work together. They were never meant to be at odds with one another. They were actually meant to work together in cohesion with one another. Jesus, he came in both grace and truth came through Jesus. Grace and truth. You know, I, I think for a lot of us, again, either intentionally or unintentionally, we have maybe subconsciously or consciously tried to separate these two. Jesus can be truth, but he can't be grace at the same time. Jesus can be grace, but he can't also be truth. But I wanna show you a, an illustration. I wanna show you an example in scripture of how Jesus comes to a woman in both the form of grace and truth. John chapter eight, verses two through 11. Here's what it says. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her gives them an invitation. He says, if you've never sinned, if you've never fallen short, if you've never made a mistake, I want you to be the first one to throw a stone. I'm giving you permission. <laughs> if you've never made a mistake, if you've never sinned, go ahead, take that stone, sling it at her right now, go for it. He gives them an invitation. But if you haven't, drop your stones. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older ones first until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Catch this, then neither do I condemn you. <laughs> then neither do I condemn you, grace. Though you may deserve it, grace. Though you may have earned it, grace. Remember, we didn't earn it or achieve it. Grace is a gift. And he looks this woman in the eyes and he says, neither do I condemn you. I know you might feel ashamed. I know you might feel condemned, but look around you. Nobody's left and I have not condemned you either. This is grace. This is grace. Now catch this. Jesus declared, go now and leave your life of sin, truth. Go now and leave your life of sin, truth. Grace and truth working together, not separated. Jesus didn't just approach her in one and leave out the other, but he approaches this woman and he 
wraps his arms, metaphorically speaking, around her. He embraces her with grace. He embraces her in her moment of affliction. He shows her and reminds her that it had nothing to do with her mistake and everything to do what he w- with what he was going to do for her, with the place that he was going to take for her. He was going to step in her place and take that from her. He was not going to condemn the woman for the mistake that she made, but at the same time, simultaneously, while extending grace, he empowers with truth. Go and leave your life of sin. How do grace and truth work together? How do they work together? We got three simple points. First one, grace sets me free. Truth will help me stay free. Grace sets me free. The truth of his word will help me to stay free. The reality is I need his grace to cover my sin. I needed his grace. I needed what Jesus did as he stepped in my place. He who knew no sin becoming sin so that I could be the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I needed his grace to cover my sin, to cover my wrongs. Maybe for you, you're in here and you're like, I can't really relate to that story. Well, here's the thing. Sin is sin. Whether it was getting caught in the act of adultery or it was something different. Maybe for you, it's greed. Maybe for you, it's comparison, envy. That's really the root of comparison. It's envying somebody else's life. Maybe for you, it's lust. Maybe it's something different. I don't know what package or form sin looks like for you, but the reality is we have all fallen short. We've all sinned. Oh, but truth, grace might set me free, but the truth of his word will ensure that I stay free. Oh, the truth of his word will ensure that if I continue to follow his ways, his promise is that he will set me free. But now he's going to take me on a journey of not just getting free for a moment, but staying free for a lifetime. Now, I'm not saying you're never going to struggle. I'm not saying that if you just follow the truth of his words, you'll never make another mistake. I'm not saying that. But here's what I know. If I want to experience freedom, it comes through grace. But if I want to stay there, I have to adopt and inherit and accept the truth of his word. It has to be a part of the equation. I don't know what it is for you, but for each one of us, it's something. What I know is grace will cover my sin, but truth will help me to break the cycle. Truth will help me to break the cycle. Truth will help me to break that cycle, the vicious cycle that I find myself in at times. Maybe you can relate. The vicious cycle of falling short, going back to God and receiving his grace, but going back to the same mistake over and over and over again, creating a cycle and a pattern of going back to all of the same mechanisms that leave us empty. Do you want to know what I believe one of the real issues is in this equation? If we are struggling with the cycle of sin, can I just be really honest? I think that for all of us, for all of us, if we are treating grace like a commodity and not a person, we probably just don't understand the value that it took to get to us. Because I treat things differently that have greater value to me. I'll give you an example. If I'm Test driving a BMW, I'm probably going to treat that a little differently than driving a beat up Monte Carlo. Now, this is a really weird illustration in parallel, but I think you're getting the picture. We usually treat things differently that hold more value for us. So my question for you is, do you just not understand the depth of what he paid for you? My question is, do we understand what price he really paid? Because all I know is whenever I look at Jesus and I see the finished work on the cross and I look back at my sin, not just yesterday, but I recognize how much I need him today. The more I follow Jesus, the more I recognize my need for him every single day. The more I follow him, I don't get to a certain position where all of a sudden I think that I've made it or I've arrived. No, the more I follow Jesus, the more I'm aware of how much I really need him. But if we don't have a picture of grace... If we don't have a clear picture, an honest picture, a true picture of what Jesus did for you and I, then we will always treat grace cheaply. But he paid a high price for you and me. 
a high price. Oh, he paid the highest price. The Bible says the wages of your sin and mine was death. That was, that was the cost. The cost was death and he paid it. The cost was death and he paid it. The cost, the ramification, if he didn't, was eternal separation from God. But because of what he did, you and I can have a real right relationship with our father. The wages, the ramifications, the cost, it was death and he paid it. He paid it for you and he paid it for me. But we have to make sure that we're not treating his grace like it's cheap or it came at a cheap price. Now I have another encouragement. Maybe for some of us, maybe Jesus really is just grace and and I just wanna leave truth out. Maybe that's the encouragement you need tonight. Maybe for some of us though, we've been following Jesus for a while and we could kind of relate a little bit more with the people that were picking up their stones. <laughs> Maybe we could relate a little bit more with the people that were picking up their stones. Look, man, I've been doing this for a while. I'm cool. I got it all figured out. I've been following Jesus for a long time. Things are cool with me and God. The encouragement that you might need is that grace cannot be <laughs> removed from the equation. Because Romans 3.23, <laughs> what's funny is, I almost did it again. Romans 3.23, it says that all have sinned and fall short of God's glorious standard. For a little while, I actually got in the habit, subconsciously, not intentionally, I got in the habit of reciting that scripture this way. All have sinned and fallen short, completely past tense. It says that all have sinned, past tense, but it says that we all fall short, present tense. I actually got in the habit of misappropriating that text and misusing that scripture. But the reminder that some of us might need tonight is that you didn't get here on your own. It took a lot of grace. <laughs> it took a lot of grace to get me to where I am. It took a lot of grace to get me up in the morning. It might've just taken a lot of grace to get you to work today. It might've just taken a lot of grace to get you to school today. It might've just taken a lot of grace to get you here tonight. I don't know what reminder you need, but the reminder you might need is that you didn't get here on your own and we need his grace. I can't just be holding stones looking for people to persecute. I have to consistently be softened by the grace of my king and grace will keep you soft. Grace will ensure that you never get to a point in your journey where you think that you've just arrived. No, I know that I am in pursuit. I'm pursuing becoming more like Jesus and until I see him, him. Oh, that's, that's the journey. <laughs> Till I see him, that's the journey. But grace and truth, they work together. Number two, number two, you can write this down. Grace will empower me. Truth will equip me. I'm going to have Alexa come back up here and she's going to help me on the keys for a moment. Grace will empower me. Truth will equip me. Another definition for grace is empowerment. Yes, it's God's unearned, undeserved favor in your life and mine. But another definition for grace is empowerment. Grace actually empowers us to live the life God's called us to live. Grace, when we have the right perspective, when we have the right understanding of grace, it empowers us. <laughs> it's actually empowerment. But for some of us, grace might feel more like enablement than empowerment. And the reality is, if we aren't careful, grace can enable us at times. We can become enabled by grace instead of empowered by it in the way God designed it. But when grace has the proper place in my life, when I have a pure perspective, a clear picture, a good understanding, when I am looking at the person of Jesus and I recognize what he's really done for me, when I recognize the wages that he paid, when I recognize the cost that he paid, when I realize the price that was on my sin, then I look at Jesus and I see a clear picture of true grace. And grace empowers me. It doesn't enable me to keep making the same mistakes but the truth of his word will equip me. So here's how those two work together. 
I had Alexa come up here because she's gonna do what I can't. <laughs> I'm very musically uninclined for those of you who didn't know. Um, and I, I'm gonna have her play some keys. So um, I want you to envision that the keys themselves, that represents grace, right? So she plays a couple keys and, and you get a certain sound whenever you just play the keys by themselves. Yeah, that sounds fine. Sounds pretty good. She's really good. I'm not saying that she's not good. I'm saying it sounds pretty good, you know? It's noise. Grace, <laughs> grace will give us the empowerment. Grace will champion us to become more like Jesus. Grace, grace will give us the thing that we need. Grace will give us the urgency. Grace will move us forward. Grace will empower us and give us courage. Grace will move us forward. But the truth of his word will equip us. So that raw energy and passion that I get whenever I encounter grace, that excitement that I get, that fervency that I get when I encounter grace, when I realize how much God's done for me, it's really just raw energy unless it is channeled in the right way. Now, when grace and truth work together, now grace is empowering me to become the person that God's called me to be. But the equipment of his truth, the truth of his word, the equipment that he gives me will help to sharpen the tools, will help to sharpen the edges, help to, help to dust off and, and smooth out some of the edges. And so now grace might sound like the keys, but truth is the pedal. Now, when you put those two together, makes a full chord. I think we all can agree that sounds a little bit better than just the keys by themselves. If she was just pressing on the pedal, the pedal wouldn't create this sound. If it were all truth and no grace, we wouldn't get the sound that we get. If it were all grace but no truth, we wouldn't get this, this sound. This, it almost sounds like a symphony. It feels like things are coming into balance. It, it feels like it just makes sense. And it's because grace and truth were never meant to be separated. They were never meant to be at odds. They were always meant to work together. Jesus is both grace and truth. There might be moments where I need a little bit more grace. There might be moments where I need a little bit more truth in my life. I might need enlightened to the truth of his word. I might need corrected in a few things, but the reality is they work together. He's not all grace and no truth. He's not all truth and no grace. He is a combination of the two. And when they come together, there's a beautiful harmony that's created when we encounter our King. Oh, when he is both grace and truth. Oh, it brings this harmony to my life because now he's empowered me with his grace and I have the equipment that I need to keep moving forward. He's empowered me with his grace and now I have the equipment that I need to keep becoming more like Jesus. I'm gonna have the band come back up. Last one, number three. Grace will comfort me. Truth will correct me. Grace will comfort me. Truth will correct me. In Hebrews 12, it says that he corrects those whom he loves. He corrects those whom he loves. I think for a lot of us, we have a really jaded image of correction because correction has almost become a form of canceling in our minds. Because if you correct me, then you don't love me. If you correct me, then you don't believe in me. If you correct me, then you just don't like me. If you correct me, then you see something that you don't like. Where do we get so far off in our understanding of correction? Because according to my Bible, correction actually is a definition of love. It's an illustration and manifestation of the love of God. And I'll tell you what's loving to me. What's loving to me is when my God corrects me and stops me in my tracks, knowing that the direction I'm going could lead to destruction, knowing the direction I'm going could lead to hurt and lead to pain. Here's what real love looks like. It looks like someone that's willing to look you in the eyes and tell you what you do not want to hear. It's someone who is more concerned with who you're becoming and not just satisfying every need that you have right now. It's someone who's willing to look at you 
and say, there's so much more for you. I'm not letting you stay where you are. I'm thankful for leaders in my life that have looked me in the eyes and don't want me to stay where I am. That's love. That is love. That is love. It may not feel like it in the moment. Believe me, I get it. Sometimes when God corrects me and he arrests my spirit, it doesn't feel great. But almost simultaneously, as I'm wrestling with correction, whether it's from a leader in my life, trust me, Derek and Kyle have done plenty of correcting for me and I'm thankful for it. At first, it was a little hard. Correction is hard for all of us. It's not easy. But if we understand what it's producing, if we understand what it's producing, if we can put our eyes ahead of us, if we can see the joy, come on, the joy set ahead of us, we can know that when we're corrected or we're comforted, grace might come for me, but the truth of his word will correct me when I need it. Maybe you do need comforted. Maybe you're here or you're watching online and you just need comforted. You've been discouraged. Life's been difficult. You face some pretty serious battles. And right now you need his comfort. <laughs> the good news is our God will always meet you in the way that you need met. Oh, if you need comfort, he'll give you comfort. If you need corrected, he'll correct you softly and subtly. Like the softest right hook to your jaw if that's even possible. Exactly, that's what I mean. It doesn't make sense. It's like, oh, it hurts so good. I love it. <laughs> Ow. Whatever you need, he will meet your need. I want you to stand up to your feet. We're gonna have a moment of response. But here's what I think of. When I think of Jesus as grace, coming in grace, extending grace, I think of the Lamb of God. When I think of Jesus as truth, oh, I, I think of the Lion of the tribe of Judah. And I don't know what your need is tonight. Look, you might be in here and say, I am beat up and bruised. I feel like I just walked off the street and I have some serious wounds that I need bound up. The good news for you is that if you need comfort, he will offer you comfort. If you need a visitation from the Lamb of God, he will visit you in your time of need. He always comforts those that are afflicted. He comes near to the brokenhearted. This is what his word says. If you need comfort tonight, he wants to give you comfort. If you need corrected, oh, you can get a visit from the Lion of the tribe of Judah. He wants to give you what it is that you need, but don't separate the two. We can't just see Jesus as one or the other. He is both. He's both. I don't know what your need is. He knows. I want you to close your eyes. Maybe your need, maybe the truth that's needed for you in this moment is that you need to separate from a relationship that you know is unhealthy for you. Maybe that's the word that God needs to get to your heart tonight. Maybe you need to get out of a toxic relationship. It's just not good for you. And you feel like you've been in the cycle and you can't get out. I want you to know that the truth of his word says that you're beautiful. <laughs> you're beautifully created in his image and in his likeness. You're his masterpiece and his workmanship. So you don't have to find your identity in that relationship. You don't have to find your identity in a person because they'll never complete you. They'll only ever compliment you. There's only one who completes you, it's our King. There's only one who completes you, it's Jesus. There's only one that will fulfill and satisfy every desire of my heart, it's Jesus. 
I don't know what your need is. I don't know what moment of visitation you're seeking. I don't know what you're in need of tonight, but here's what I know. Whether you feel like you need a visitation from the lion of the tribe of Judah, you need corrected in some areas of your life. You need to be awakened to the truth of what his word says. Maybe you've been struggling with identity and you need awakened to the truth of what his word says. Your identity can never be placed in something outside of Jesus. Maybe you've been finding your worth and your value in things apart from Christ. Maybe you're in here and you're bound and you're broken and you're hurt. Can I tell you, the Lamb of God was slain for your sin so that you could be free in Jesus. I don't know what your need is, but here's what I want you to do. Here's what I want you to do. If you have a need, all heads are bowed and eyes are closed. This is a moment with you and God. If you have a need, I want you to lift your hand up. If you have a need, I want you to lift your hand up. If you have a need, if you need a moment of visitation with God, I want you to lift your hand up and I want you to believe by faith that he's gonna meet you in your time of need. I want you to believe by faith that the lion of the tribe of Judah, the lamb of God will give you what it is that you need in this moment. Oh, I believe he's here. He is a firm foundation. He's the only true foundation. When the winds and waves of life arise, we were promised that we would face things. We were promised that we would face trials of many kinds. We were promised that winds and waves would arise. Matthew 7 is what this, this song derives from. Matthew 7 says, though the winds and waves arise, though they come, the promise for you and I is that winds and waves, storms of life will come. But the good news for you and me is that we can always be anchored, tethered, and rooted. We stand on a firm foundation and it is the foundation of Jesus Christ. Jesus said this, in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. This is the promise that we have in Jesus. I don't know what your need is, but why don't you lift your hands all across this place? Whatever needs you have, believe that Jesus can be the one to meet your need. Come on, let's sing it up. Well, hey, thank you guys so much for joining us tonight. And I just want to take a moment and give those of you who have never made a decision to follow Jesus, I'm gonna give you that opportunity right now. Maybe through listening to the message, you just sensed that God was tugging on your heart and you didn't really know what that meant, but maybe this was the moment that you're being prepared for. Maybe you're watching and you've never accepted Jesus into your heart as your Lord and Savior. You've never confessed him as your King. You've, you've never put your trust in the finished work of Jesus. Or maybe you're watching right now and you have before in the past, but since then you've, you've walked away from God. And I'm not talking about you just made a couple mistakes or you lied to your girlfriend or whatever. I'm saying for those of you who have followed Jesus and have stopped believing in him, if you wanna recommit your life to Jesus, I wanna give you that opportunity right now. Because the Bible makes it super clear in, in John 14, verse six, that Jesus, he is the way, the truth, and the life. In other words, no one can come to the Father, no one can be guaranteed life in heaven whenever we die unless they simply confess that Jesus is Lord. It doesn't come through good actions or good deeds. I can't do enough good things to earn more of God's approval or enough bad things to, to disearn his approval. All I need to do is put my trust in what Jesus did because none of us are perfect. We've all fallen short of the glory of God, but thank God that he sent Jesus to be the atonement for our sin. And now all I have to do is confess him as my Lord and receive salvation and be guaranteed, guaranteed life with God in eternity forever. So if that's you and you wanna make that decision for the first time, or you wanna recommit your life to Jesus, you wanna get some things right with God, I wanna encourage you to pray the simple prayer after me. Romans 10, nine through 10 says that all we have to do is confess with our mouth and believe in our hearts that Jesus is Lord and we can be saved. So if that's you, on either of those two invitations. I just want you to pray this prayer from your heart and from your mouth to God. You can close your eyes, bow your heads. Let's pray this prayer together. Repeat after me, Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus to die for me. I believe his finished work on the cross was more than enough to cover my sin, to cover my shame, and to cover my mistakes. I'm a new creation in Christ. In Jesus' name, everybody agree with it said, amen, amen. 
Well, hey, if you prayed that prayer for the first time or you recommitted your life to Jesus, we wanna let you know, we're celebrating with you, we're rejoicing with you. It's the best decision you could have ever made, but we don't wanna leave you there in your journey. We really wanna come alongside you and help you discover some of your next steps in your journey with the Lord, because we know that just as important as the decision is to follow Jesus, equally as important is the decision after it to start pursuing your relationship with God. This is just the beginning of a brand new start for you. And we're celebrating with you in that decision, but we wanna help you discover some of those next steps. So if you could text the you to 94,000, and we would love to get in contact with you, help you discover some of your next steps in your journey with Jesus. But I thank you so much for tuning in tonight. We love you, we believe in you, and we will see you next time.